Welcome to Since Time Immemorial, Tribal Sovereignty in Washington State. My name is Ms. Jarman. I'm a teacher at Robert Eagle Staff Middle School and a colleague of Mrs. Brown's. And we worked on this lesson together. Today's lesson revolves around three world's fairs that were held in Washington State in the 20th century and how those fairs were a representation of Washington State history. By the end of this lesson, you'll be able to name the three World's Fairs held in Washington State and share your opinion about how they represented land-based people. As you're watching the lesson, think about what a Washington-hosted World's Fair could look like today. What would we be celebrating? How could the fair do a better job of honoring land-based values? Share your thoughts with someone. Exceed standard, design your own World's Fair. Hello and welcome back to Washington State History Distance Learning with Miss Jarman. I am so excited today because we're doing one of my favorite topics and it's a topic that many of you requested when we sent that survey out and it is the World's Fair and not just the World's Fair that was held in Seattle, but Washington State has actually hosted three World's Fairs. We're going to talk about all three today. I'm just geeking out. I'm super excited. So, um, so here we go. Washington's World Fairs. Now, before we get into the three uh, World's Fairs that were held in Washington State, what even is a World's Fair? Let's unpack this a little bit. Um, so imagine the Olympics. You're familiar with the Olympics, right? When all the nations come together to uh, compete in some sports. And now imagine a science fair. Maybe you did a science fair when you were in fourth grade or maybe in sixth grade. Think about a science fair. Now think about putting the two of them together. So lots of countries coming together to um, look at their new accomplishments in science, to celebrate history. Um, think of it like that, like a big science fair for grown-ups meets the Olympics with snacks. It's a tradition that started in uh, Europe, I think France actually, in um, the, the late 1700s, early 1800s, where once a year they would just get everybody together for a big show to, um, to show their new industries and their new technology, and it was just a place to come and see it all. Another word you're going to hear a lot as we talk about World's Fairs is the word exhibition. And that's basically what it was. It was an exhibition. It was exhibits of all the good things from that particular country. So in 1851 in London, that was really the first official time that lots of countries came together in one place to show all the different countries ex exhibits. So that's gen there. So there were world spheres before that, but generally that that 1851 London one was the first official World's Fair. One common theme that you'll see in World's Fairs, especially um, um, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, is that they're showing new and future technology. And in those early fairs, electric lighting was a big feature. This was the technology was there, but it wasn't very widespread. So it was very, very exciting for people to come to these fairs and then just see what it looked like to have lights at night. That was pretty amazing to people back then. Here are some other examples of um, new technology that was introduced at various world's fairs over the years. The telephone was introduced at the World's Fair in Philadelphia in 1876. In Chicago, in 1893, at that World's Fair, they introduced the dishwasher. 
There wasn't even electricity to run a dishwasher back then, but they just introduced the concept of, hey, how about a motorized contraption that can wash a whole bunch of dishes at once? 1893, the dishwasher. Fast forward to 1939, the World's Fair in New York City introduced television. Another common theme you'll see in World's Fairs is that they would typically feature one really um, different innovative kind of building or a monument, some kind of structure to tie together the theme of the fair. Probably one of the most famous ones is the Eiffel Tower in Paris, France. That was built for the 1889 World's Fair. And um, the Ferris wheel was introduced at the Chicago World's Fair. That was a new invention at the time, and it just, this Ferris wheel became a symbol of their fair. And of course, you know this one, the Space Needle from the Seattle World's Fair in 1962. So you'll see, um, especially as we get into the 20th century, that these iconic buildings, these monuments, become a, a major part of the fair. Another important thing to consider about World's Fairs is that um, having one in your city gives your city a big boost. The city that hosts a World's Fair um, can become more famous and more well-regarded and more respected. So cities generally want to do them. Um, they want all that attention and fame. And um, it takes a lot of work and a lot of money to put on a World's Fair. So that's something to think about going forward. Typically, um, you'll see, you know, individual people make donations and then the local governments pay for them too. And each fair is a little different. So let's keep that in mind. There's a big cost to a place that hosts a World Fair, World's Fair, but there are also big benefits. All right. I now want to bring in land-based values and Judeo-Christian values again, because uh, we've been talking about these two different sets of values all throughout Washington state history. It is a recurring theme and that theme recurs in this lesson too, even though it's World's Fairs and it's fun. Um, we also kind of see colonization playing out when we start looking historically at our nation's World's Fairs and the ones in Washington. Remember how in previous les lessons we've talked about when you merge um, a Judeo-Christian set of values with um, land-based values, what we tended to end up with historically was what I'm calling colonist values. Um, these folks still see themselves as one with nature. These folks still see themselves as on top. And so by default, that puts one kind of person on top of another kind of person. Um, and that's what I'm calling colonist values. And the important thing for us to remember going forward in this lesson is that with colonist values, this person at the top cannot and will not recognize the indigenous people as fully human. It just does not fit with their worldview.
So we really see colonist values play out in these world fairs. Um, it's the colonizer who's putting on the fair to celebrate all that the colonizer has accomplished. It's basically this person's fair. Even if it's not the actual colonizer, even if it's the colonizer's grandchildren and great, great, great grandchildren, they still tend to share this perspective. As such, um, many of these world fairs celebrate historical milestones like Columbus, supposedly discovering Lewis and Clark, paving the way um, from the Northeast United States into um, the indigenous West, which then the, the United States wanted to have for themselves. The Louisiana Purchase, same thing. Thomas Jefferson just buys some colonized land from the French without really the consent of the people living on the land. These are all historical milestones being celebrated at World's Fairs. Even worse, some of the World's Fairs featured exhibits that romanticized the old plantation, which is to say, Speaking of um, colonization, this is a very important piece of United States history before we get into World's Fairs, and it is related. So everything in kind of this teal color here is what became the continental United States. We started out just with our 13 colonies over here when we became our own nation, and then gradually through Manifest Destiny, people pushed west. They took away indigenous land. We went to war with Spain to take the indigenous land that they had colonized. And, and by the end of the, um, the 1800s, we, we are from sea to shining sea, as they say. This is all now acquired by the United States of America. So in the late 1800s, even though there's no land kind of left to take, they want more. So they they start going for these other places that were colonized by Spain, like Puerto Rico and the Philippines. I'm not sure if Guam was annexed or what the situation was with them. Anyway, we, the United States goes to war with Spain to get these colonies from Spain. And the reason why they want them is so that they can place their naval ships here and form this big barrier around the continental United States. It's like, think of it as like a giant moat. This is all happening in 1898. And at the same time, um, the United States goes ahead and annexes Hawaii too. Hawaii did not agree to this or give permission for this. Um, white people had been using Hawaii for a very long time for whaling and, and growing sugar and that sort of thing. but. Uh, in 1898, the United States just basically says, okay, you know what, this is this is ours now too. So in 1898, this was something that um, Americans wanted to celebrate. They, they just thought, this is great. We have all these new places. Um, this is colonization. It's also something called imperialism, which I am not going to get into today. But I, I want you to keep this map in mind as we talk about other parts of the fairs going forward. Okay, one more thing, one last thing before I get into Washington State Fairs, because we can't really talk about World's Fairs without acknowledging that a presidential assassination happened at a World's Fair. It did not happen in Washington. It happened in Buffalo, New York, Niagara Falls in 1901. And um, President McKinley was there at the World's Fair to meet and greet the public. And there was a big long line of people to come shake his hand. And this young man, Leon Sholgosh, um, stood in the line to meet the president with a gun wrapped up in a handkerchief. And when it was his turn to shake President McKinley's hand, instead he shot President McKinley, who eventually died from his wounds. Sholkosh was a worker who had had just a terrible, terrible experiences working in factories. And he felt that he was doing the right thing. He had some mental health issues too, um, but he's quoted as saying, I killed the president because he was the enemy of the good people, the good working people. So 
for whatever that's worth, um, let's keep that in mind too. This World's Fair was a place where folks like Sholgosh, the workers, maybe didn't feel like they belonged, maybe didn't feel like it was about them. Not everybody felt that way. But the fact that one person felt that way to the point where that's, you know, he assassinated a president there, that's worth thinking about. All right, we are finally ready to get into talking about the World's Fairs that Washington has hosted. Here we go. As I mentioned, Washington has hosted three World's Fairs. The first one was held in 1909, right here in Seattle on um, the UW campus. And a lot of what you see on the UW campus today was uh, built there in 1909 to structure the World's Fair. Very cool. Now we all know about this one, 1962 Seattle. And then there was also one in 1974 in Spokane, Washington. And my husband remembers going to this one when he was three years old. So ask your parents, ask your grandparents, they might remember going to this fair, maybe even this fair, ask them. Okay, first up, it is 1909 in Seattle, and it is the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition. Take a look at that picture. That is what the UW campus looked like in 1909. And the fountain and the, um, the pavilion and some of the buildings were built especially for the World's Fair. And so you can kind of see its footprint if you've been on the UW campus. You can still see that World's Fair's footprint today. I'd mentioned that these World Fairs were often um, commemorating big events in American history. And this World's Fair was commemorating the Alaska Gold Rush that brought all that wealth to Seattle. It was also kind of touting Alaska and the industry and the gold available there. The main exhibitors at this fair were mostly um, from the United States. The, um, states like New York and California came to represent. Individual counties in Washington state came to represent. They were there to show their, their farming technology and their products and all of that. Japan um, came to the fair too to exhibit. Now you'll remember from um, our discrimination lesson that relations between white Seattleites and Japanese American citizens in Seattle were very strained at this time, but um, there was a very valuable trade relationship between the United States and Japan and based out of Seattle. So everybody kind of had to put their issues aside and um, honor the Japanese visitors that came to the fair. China uh, did not come to our World's Fair in 1909. I believe they were invited and declined, but the Chinese Americans who were living in Seattle put on a China exhibit themselves. Um, they really felt that this was a time to showcase their culture and to kind of show themselves beyond the stereotypes that existed. So China and Japan were represented at this World's Fair in 1909. Alaska and Hawaii were not states yet, but both of them had been colonized and subdued by Europeans over the centuries and then annexed by the United States. Annexed means taken without permission of the indigenous people who were living there at the time, the people who had been living there since time immemorial. But as far as the United States understood things, they believed they'd acquired these great new places with these great new resources and they wanted to show it off. And what better place than the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition? While they're exhibiting the resources from Alaska and Hawaii, the fair is also exhibiting the indigenous people from Alaska and Hawaii and showing their, their customs and their cultures but not in a super respectful way. There's definitely an underlying tone that the United States is better and that these indigenous people are just kind of strange and they sure are lucky to be colonized. 
Nobody comes right out and says that, but that's kind of the tone. But the really awful piece of this um, was the display of Igorot people from the Philippines. A few years earlier, you'll remember from that map, um, Spain had ceded the Philippines to the United States in the Spanish-American War. Well, the United States continued fighting with the Filipino people who wanted their independence. So even though at the time most Filipino people were Catholic, having been colonized by Spain since the 1500s, the United States military brought this uh, group of indigenous people called the Igorot from the Philippines to the United States for the purpose of, of showing them off as representative of Filipino culture and and in just kind of a really gross way. They called them headhunters. They had them really highlight um, things about their culture that might scare people. And um, and they toured them around the country. They were they were at Coney Island and they were at the Seattle World's Fair in 1909. Um, um, not awesome. Um, the, the scholar Robin K. Wright says that um, these human displays, it was part of the imperial colonization of the world. And by putting on display the so-called primitive cultures from these exotic places, then the country could show why their colonization was beneficial to the world. So there that is. And then in the picture, you can see there's a, the um, Igorot folks are putting on a show for the people at the fair and everybody's just gathered around to watch. So there that is. And fast forward, we're gonna go forward in history about 50 years or so. It is now the mid 20th century and um, colonization looks a little different. We started out kind of just like this now the United States is spread all the way from ocean to ocean, taking territories from the Spanish while they're at it. They've acquired all these naval bases in these outlying areas, Hawaii, Philippines, way over here. There's not much Earth left to colonize. So now we start looking at the moon. Now another country was looking at the moon too, and that, that was Russia. So in the 50s and 60s, um, the United States had their sights set on the moon and they wanted to be the first country to put people on the moon. That was a big focus in the 50s and 60s. And that is what became the theme for the 1962 Seattle World's Fair. It was all about the future with an emphasis on the space race, seeing who could be the first uh, country to land people on the moon, the space race, they called it. So the fair introduces the world to NASA, and it was very big on science and just promoting science as really like a, a patriotic thing. And science was gonna be our path to victory over the Russians. The fair also dramatically changes the look of Seattle. Remember that um, in the 50s and, and prior to that, the city wasn't really regarded as a major city. Uh, you know, we had lumber, we had airplanes, but uh, we were a port, but it wasn't really looked at in the same way as like New York or Chicago or the big cities. So the planners of the fair saw an opportunity to change that. And they wanted to impress all these visitors who would be coming for the World's Fair. And one way to do that was with these new modern buildings. So we see the Space Needle, and let's actually take a look at the then and now. So this is a view of the city of Seattle in 1962, taken from the Space Needle. That's about how tall the buildings were, and um, this is what the city looked like. Now let's fast forward to today. Same vantage point, but look at how much it's changed. Look at the tall glass skyscrapers and the tall buildings, and um, it's just a much bigger city now. 
And the 1962 World's Fair was kind of the catalyst for all of that. That's how it all gets started. They called it the Century 21 Exposition. Remember, it was the 20th century. So talking about the 21st century at that time felt very, ooh, the future. And we had those skyscrapers, we had a uh, monorail and the Space Needle. We had NASA explaining about the space program. We even had the Bubbleator. It was this bubble-shaped elevator that could fit about 100 people. It was in the Key Arena, what is now the Key Arena. And it would take people upstairs to this exhibit about the future. It was just so space age, futuristic. So with all this focus on the future, do you think the World's Fairs had finally ended that colonizing tone and stopped putting indigenous humans on display as they had in the earlier World's Fairs? Let's think about that. Is it likely? Well, things were different in 1962. Um, you know, there weren't any living human exhibits in, at this World's Fair like there was in 1909. Things were different but they weren't exactly better. We'd had systems in place for years at this point of reservation, boarding schools, and those things had a devastating impact on the people. Generations of trauma, loss, and displacement ends up leading to widespread poverty. Now, the United States tries to, to help through attempts at reorganization here and there, but the United States could not seem to fully realize that they sort of created this situation. They had a role in, um, in disenfranchising people in the first place. So in 1956, we see something called the American Indian Relocation Program. And the point of it was to um, these reservations that the United States had created and forced people to stay on were not doing very well. So in 1956, they had this program to take people out of the reservation and relocate them to American cities. Seattle was, was one place. You know, of course, when they got to Seattle, they experienced the racially restrictive real estate practices that were widespread at the time. We call this redlining. So by the time of the 1962 World's Fair, uh, white people generally regarded Native Americans with pity and kind of an undertone of blame. Meanwhile, there's a growing interest in tribal art and artifacts. For centuries, white people had amassed collections of appropriated items. So maybe way, way back in the day, they'd been traded with the maritime fur traders. Um, oftentimes, more likely, these artifacts and art were seized or stolen, stolen from graves, stolen during war. And then the, the white people who came into possession of these artifacts kept them or sold them, and these items just moved around among white people who kept them in what they called curiosity cabinets or put them in museums or gave them to universities. And around this time in history, um, um, white anthropologists and artists are, are starting to be interested in tribal art. So there's one such collection. Um, this anthropologist in Seattle um, goes to a lot of trouble to track down all these artifacts around the world. But um, doesn't really include any indigenous people in that effort. She just amasses all these artifacts and she creates a display at the World's Fair, um, which was, again, you know, meant to be a celebration. Here's the poster that they, that they used to promote it. And here's that uh, professor with all her white students just kind of picking over this native art without really much native input. So it was meant to be, you know, yay, Northwest Coast. But um, 
it was given a very inferior placement in the art exhibit. There was a lot of art at this World's Fair, and the native art was kind of just put in a in the lobby that you walk through on your way to see the, the Western art. Also, they set the artifacts up just as sculptures and didn't really explain their original purpose. They didn't have dates on them. They didn't even explain which tribes they came from. So, you know, I guess it's a step forward from having people on display like it's a zoo, but it was still, you know, not great. I will say there was also a native artist who was commissioned to um, carve story poles for the fair. Um, so he was he was a part of that too. Fast forward again. So just a few short years after the 1962 World's Fair, with the increasing number of Native Americans relocating to cities, intertribal communities start to grow. And as these folks come together, they find strength in their numbers. We start to see the emergence of the American Indian Movement, the American Indian Civil Rights Act of 1968, and the Seattle United Indians of all tribes in 1969 to 70. This is right around the time when there's this great civil rights awakening throughout the country. This is um, contemporary with what uh, Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks and um, it's a it's an important piece of our history too. We'll talk more about that next week but just to put the next World's Fair into perspective um, we kind of get, get a little bit woke in these intervening years before 19, six, between 1962 and 1974. And that spirit of activism from the late 60s finds its way into Washington's next World Fair. This one was not held in Seattle. It was held in Spokane in the eastern part of the state. And this was the very first World's Fair to feature an environmental theme. They called it Celebrating Tomorrow's Fresh New Environment. Since that time, um, almost every World's Fair has focused on environment and saving the environment in some capacity. And that starts in Spokane in 1974. So they're trying. Um, this World's Fair in 1974 you know, really claimed to celebrate Native American her heritage. Even reading about it now to prepare for this lesson, um, people kind of say, yes, it was all about Native American heritage. However, um, critics observe that, yeah, okay, so they said that, but was it really a celebration? Local tribes were invited kind of late in the process. They were not consulted. They weren't really included in any of the major planning. And they were given this really small space to work within. So they were touting Native American heritage, but the actual Native Americans involved in the fair didn't all feel all that celebrated. I hope that you're familiar with the writer Sherman Alexie. And if not, I will try to work that into future lessons. He is um, a Native American activist, writer, and poet, and um, he is amazing. Well, he attended the Spokane World's Fair as a child. His mom was one of the tribal dancers in the exhibit. So while his mom was dancing, he and his dad explored the fair. And he remembers looking around at the, at the waterways and uh, there's this big river and this big waterfall in Spokane. And years ago, um, all of that was dammed up and rerouted to support the industry in Spokane, which cut off the tribe's salmon supply in the process. This is when, um, those of you who did the fish wars lesson, this is kind of when that's all happening. So young Sherman Alexi is at this World's Fair looking at the waterfall and the waterways that were appropriated from his people and rerouted the salmon away from them. And he captures this moment in a poem. I'm gonna put the whole poem on Schoology, but here's the part of it that talks about the fair. That was the summer of continual fireworks. Over Spokane Falls, in a blue gondola, 
I leaned over the edge and saw ghosts of salmon jumping. It was the kind of celebration this country would never see again. And there it is, Washington State's World's Fairs. The good, the bad, the ugly. So I want us to use this information to now imagine what could a Washington hosted World's Fair look like today? We're going to have to really use our imagination because um, in COVID times, obviously we're not gonna all get together at a World's Fair, but imagine that we're planning one maybe for a year or two in the future. It's going to be held in Washington State. So think 2022, 2023. What technology and art and industry would we be celebrating? Who would we want to invite to show their work, to show their science, to show their technology, to show their art? Who would we want to invite to that World's Fair? What would we want to exhibit? Remember that World's Fairs often commemorate an important event in history. So what historical events from Washington State history would we be commemorating at this imaginary World's Fair? Remember that commemorating doesn't necessarily have to mean, yay, it was so great. Commemorating can also be a way of showing ownership over the parts of our history that we're not so proud of. What historical events could we be commemorating at a World's Fair held in Washington State now or in a year or two? Think about that from the perspective of since time immemorial. And here is the since time immemorial time. Over here in this colorful part, this is just how long white people of European descent have been living on this continent. And this tiny little space here, that's the space where the World's Fairs in Washington have taken place. So let's think a little more broadly. People have lived here since time immemorial. How could this fair do a better job of honoring land-based values. What could a fair that we put on now or in the near future do to truly honor indigenous people and land-based values? What part of Washington state would host this fair? We've had two in Seattle. Would we have another one in Seattle? We've had one in Spokane. Could we have it in Spokane? What about someplace we've never had a World's Fair before? Yakima or Walla Walla or Vancouver or the islands. Where would be a good place for a new Washington State World's Fair? Very important. What sorts of rides and food and features would this fair have? What do you think? What kind of food could we serve that would really showcase Washington State at its best? What kind of rides? What kind of features? We're using our imagination here. We can do whatever we think would be amazing. So we're going to put that imagination to work and design our own World's Fair. Think about all of those um, topics that I gave you. And if you want to work with each other over Zoom, you can do that. And you can do it any way that you like. Make a drawing of it. Design a new kind of building. Design um, just like the layout of the fair. Make a list of who the exhibitors should be. What historical events it should be. Any way you want to do this. Drawing. Pictures. You could do a PowerPoint. You could just write a list in the, um, in the comments section. Anything you like. 
but let's put all our knowledge about Washington state history and all our knowledge about World's Fairs together and try to imagine and present just the coolest, best, most honoring of all the people of Washington state kind of fair that we could put on at some future date. I can't wait to see what you do. All right, let's get to it. I will see you next time.